Okay, good morning. Hello. Welcome to the developer track. So today, if you want to get hands-on with building applications with uh, Couchbase Server, this is the place to be. Uh, there's plenty else around in the other tracks as well, which would be useful. But uh, this is definitely the place if you want to get the hands-on developer side of Couchbase Server. Um, and we're going to kick off today with a little bit about modeling data for a document database like Couchbase. Uh, so a bit about me. I'm Matthew Ravel. I work at, uh, out of the London office for Couchbase. And I'm a developer advocate. So I kind of do things like this, go to meetups, write blog posts, that type of thing. And uh, I'll be around all the next couple of days. So if you want to grab me to ask any questions about this talk or anything else about the Couchbase developer community, then please do uh, speak to me. OK, so data modeling. It's something that is a well-established discipline with a great deal of learning and a great deal of uh, academic thoughts gone into. Um, but that's primarily for relational databases. When we're talking about uh, data modeling for document databases and key value stores, we're, we're still learning, really, about what works at scale and, and what works for the type of applications that we're building now. So it's not a case of we have a, you know, a, a whole shelf full of books that we can refer to as we would do in the, in the relational world. Instead, here we're, we're looking at, at basically uh, building knowledge on the fly. You know, we're learning the best practices as we, as we come about them in production. And so it's quite an interesting time to be building applications, you know, because we're, we're, we're effectively um, forging a new path. But there are some lessons that, that, that have been learned and that we can share, even though this current phase of non-relational databases has been going for perhaps only 10 years now. You know, around 2005, things kicked off with, uh, I guess, CouchDB's launch in, uh, all, all the way back then. So I mentioned in the talk title that it's three or more things about data modeling for, for document databases. So yeah, it's, it's grown from just three, but let, let's go through them. Um, so the first thing is that really there are, as we've been hearing today in, in, the, in the plenaries, there are different ways of querying Couchbase. Um, and the way that you query Couchbase will depend largely on two things. So what are, those, what are those three types of query? One is key value, clearly. One is nickel, which we've been hearing about a lot today already, and you'll hear loads more about in most of the tracks today. And then there's views, which um, if you've been using Couchbase already, you've, you've almost certainly touched. So you know, basically creating map with optional reduce uh, functions to go out and run through the JSON documents and give you back an index uh, based on what it finds. Uh, so it's three different types of query. And the, the, the way to choose which type of query you're going to use, like I say, depends on a couple of things. One is, do you know up front, before you roll out your application, you know, do you have an idea of what the queries will be, will be or at least the vague shape of them? Are the queries going to be predictable? Or are they going to be ad hoc? Are they things that you need to come up with on the fly based on user behavior or the shape of the data itself? And the other is, where do you want the, the computation to happen? So is it going to be in the application layer, which is where, so far, m most of the NoSQL databases have said, OK, if you want to do anything fancy, you need to do it in the, in the application layer. Or is it going to be that you want to offload it to the data layer, Couchbase? which is you know, the, the route that we're taking with Nickel and that we've already had with Views. So broadly speaking, you're looking at um, predictable queries that you are where most of the work's happening in the application layer. You probably couldn't work fairly uh, happily with just standard key value uh, document access. So we'll look at that in a minute. And uh, effectively pre-computing answers and storing them in Couchbase for later retrieval. Um, if, you're, if you, again, have predictable queries which uh, you want to offload to the, to, to the database layer for, for whatever reason, that might be that the, the, uh, the computation happens better with Couchbase because you know, you're, you're distributing the load of the, of the query across all the different servers and then bringing the answer back, then maybe views will work for you. And then we get into the, the newer stuff with Couchbase, Nickel. So, I put here that it, you know, it's best suited for the ad hoc queries. But um, I mean, you can use, obviously, Nickel for, for predictable querying. But the reason I mentioned ad hoc querying goes into a lot of what we, we heard about earlier in, in, the, in the main room of 
effectively, you're, you're now, rather than pulling out these, these full objects and then processing them in the application layer, you're now able to ask, ask Couchbase questions in the way that you would do with a relational database and have it come back with the answer and not necessarily need to care too much about how the data is stored and what shape it takes. All you care about is the shape of the answer. Okay, so we're going to spend most of the time looking at key value because this is where, even with nickel coming, this is where a lot of the, the, the uh, effort that we will spend as application developers will lie um, in doing simple key value queries with, a, with a, a system like Couchbase. And also it's where a lot of the best practice has built up. So what are the, the broad lessons for key value? So the, the first one is, we want to pre-compute answers asynchronously. We, so I'll come on to this in a bit more, but the, the general idea is that using Couchbase as a, a store for answers that you've already computed in the application layer, and then you're pulling them out later. Another is you're just storing object state. You know, there's, there's not necessarily much computation involved. You're just storing, pulling out um, a state, serializing it to JSON, and then popping it into Couchbase. Um, there, then there are a couple of lessons and things you need to think about. One is when do you embed data all in one massive document or larger document? And the other is when is it appropriate to refer to documents in a kind of normalized form? You know, so you, you sort of have references between documents. And then the last part is you need to design your keys well. Um, because when the key is your only or your, your main route in, your index to the data, you need to know that you're going to be able to find that key again. OK, so let's start with pre-computed answers. What do we mean by that? So in the relational world, we're used to um, having data in a state that we can ask almost any question of it. And, and that's fine. You know, that's good. That gives us a, a whole broad range of possibilities. And what, what's happening is you know, every time that you uh, you want to get that data back, you go and ask the same, data, same question. And what, so basically, you write a SQL query, you go in, you ask that question, and it's computed in the same way. There are all the same number of disk seeks involved. There's all the same computation, and then it gives you back the, the answer. Now, obviously, in the real world in production, you know, we have caching and things like that. But generally speaking, the relational world is, I've got some data. It's in a state that allows me to ask any question of it. And I'm going to ask that question multiple times. Every time I want to get that answer back, I'm going to ask the same question. And that, that's fine up until a point. You know, obviously, once you, you grow and you start to scale, then it seems computationally perhaps wasteful to ask that same question over and over again at, at the time that you want to present some data to, the, to a user. So you know, you've got users involved, and they're waiting for their airline reservation to come up or their social media page to come up. You don't want to be put in the, uh, the, the querying of the data and assembling the answer back together into that time when that, that human being is waiting for something to happen. Um, but like I say, that's, that's, that has its place. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, they can be. So, I mean, I'll, I'll give you some examples in a moment. Um, so, anyway, so, uh, so far, like I say, that's one way that we've looked at kind of relational data spaces. Whereas a document store, a key value store, is more like a, a library of answers. You know, so instead of having a single source of truth about one p particular piece of data, you have lots of different routes into the data that you're looking at. So we need to, in a, uh, a non-relational model in the key value store, uh, we need to get much more used to having um, the idea of, of, of duplicated content, but accessing it in, in, in context. So if you go into a library, then it's very likely that Darwin's theory of evolution is, is uh, explained in many different books. And that's fine. We're used to that. That's OK. That's, we're not going to complain that the library isn't sufficiently normalized. But what we will do is we'll, we'll find that it's convenient to go into those different explanations of, of, of the theory of evolution because they, they come to us in a book in a context which is appropriate. So if we're looking at it from a how it's um, maybe affected the teaching of, uh, of, of science in school, 
then we'll have a book that describes it in that context. If we're looking at it from just a pure description of what Darwin wrote, then we'd, you know, we'd go straight to the origin of species. Um, so my point here is that a, a document database is much more like a, a library of answers. It's much more like a, a place where you have to, first up, get used to the idea that you know, you're going to duplicate information across different documents and then access that, those answers in context. So what do I mean by in context? Um, well, if you look at um, uh, Martin Fowler's website, Martin Fowler is a, a, a ThoughtWorks consultant who did a lot of the, uh, the early, I guess, writing and thinking about how NoSQL databases w could be used in, uh, in real world systems. And uh, he describes the idea of the answer-oriented or aggregate-oriented database. Um, and here we have basically an order form. So in the real world, or in the physical world, when we have an order form, generally speaking, we're filling out a, a single piece of paper onto which we put all of, all of the data uh, related to that order. Uh, whereas then, if we were then to enter that into a computer system backed by a relational database, we would then split all of that out into neatly normalized rows in different tables, and every time we want to query it, we'd then piece all of that back together and, yeah, present it back as a single order form. Um, whereas in the aggregate-oriented database model, uh, basically, Marketing Fowler says, you know, it's, it's much more efficient to access together the data that we, sorry, to store together the data that we access together. Um, so if you have a, a document like an order form or a, um, you know, user profile or something like that, or a session, then it's much easier in, in most contexts to store that together as a single JSON document rather than to split it out. Um, because what happens is we're always more likely to access that data together as a whole than we are to, um, than we are maybe to access parts of it. So here, you know, it's fair to say that the line items, the actual uh, details of the order, the things that we're ordering are going to stay the same um, and be shared amongst multiple orders. But the, the, the document as a whole will, generally speaking, be presented as a whole. And this, this is something that we can see in, in, in examples such as, so I don't know how popular Skyscanner is in, in the US, but it's basically a, a search engine for, for airline bookings, for, for airline fares. And they're, they're a Couchbase user. What they do is they will go out, they'll scrape the various sites, and they'll also do API calls to different airlines and travel agents. And then based on your, your, uh, your, your request, so here I'm looking for flights from Manchester in the UK to San Francisco. What they'll do is they will go out, they'll get all of those, and they'll present them to you. Fine, that's obvious. Uh, but that's when they actually start looking at this as an aggregate. Because instead of then going out and doing that same query every time that someone wants to do a search from Manchester to San Francisco, uh, they then store the results in Couchbase and present it back as a cached version. So effectively, what they're doing is they're they're pre-computing, I guess, the answer for the next time that someone wants to do this search. And they're caching it as a JSON document that they then serve out in, in the form of a, a bunch of uh, uh, flights and times and prices and so on. Um, and to go back to the, the kind of social media example, you know, if, if you have a, a, a wall that all of your friends follow, now, you could co compute that every time. So every time you view it, you end up waiting around because it's querying all of your uh, friends and what their latest status is and then builds the feed. The other way to do it is to do it asynchronously, to pre-compute the answer. So if I go along and, and uh, add my, my uh, status as being, I'm a Couchbase Connect, the, the asynchronous way to do it would be to then go, at the point that I post it, would be to first um, update my own feed so I can read my own write. And then asynchronously, once, once I've been told that it was OK, go and start building the new versions of the walls, the news feeds, um, as JSON documents that they then store, a, store in Couchbase, and then they, uh, ha that happens asynchronously. So you, you're not then making people wait around for the news feed to be built. OK, so the next question is, when to embed, when to refer? How much should we denormalize effectively? So we're talking about you know, database like Couchbase as being denormalized. But there is some level of normalization, I'd say. So let's have a look at how we'd uh, represent an e-commerce order in a, in a relational database. 
So very simple kind of example here, but you have the order details, and then that points out to um, the original order document, uh, the customer details based on the ID, and then the products themselves. So you have canonical versions of each of these, obvious stuff. Then you want to transfer that into a non-relational database, into a document database. There are, there are a couple of ways you could do it. One is we could go back to that aggregate where uh, the Martin Fowler talks about, where we store everything together. So you have a single JSON document that, that includes all of my details, includes all of the details about the product, and everything. So you, you're doing one get, and then you've got the, 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 the full order details. That's fine to some extent. But it also means that you're duplicating a lot of data. You know, you, 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 you're bringing in some risk of, of drift, of things not being consistent, and also maybe it seems a bit wasteful to, over a database of many, many thousands or millions of documents, be duplicating so much data. So you might think, well, perhaps it's better to take this document and split it out, to start referring to, to, to uh, things instead. And this is kind of what we're looking at with Nickel, but I'm still kind of talking about the, the key value model here instead. Um, so here we have a, a, an order document, and just one now, because now we can nest in it the, the individual line items instead of having to have a relationship for that. And then I'm, but, but rather than embedding the things that will be data that will be used in multiple documents, I'm, I'm just referring to it. So here, you know, I'm referring to the customer by an ID number of 40 and the product by the ID number of one. So there we're, you know, having some level of, of normalization, I guess you could call it. Um, and that means that instead of having this, this great big, I guess, canonical document, you're having multiple ones that you then pull together at read time. So when should you embed data and when should you refer? Um, really, I mean, embedding data is, is something you want to do when it's, it's absolutely vital that read time is going to be really, really fast. You know, you, you just want to do one read. So, okay, with Couchbase, that's, if it's in your working set and it's in RAM, that's going to be sub-millisecond. So you want to make sure that the data is coming out really fast. So fine, embed it all in one, one document. Um, but there are a couple of things that you need to bear in mind. It should ideally be uh, slow-moving data. Um, so what do I mean by that? Basically, is, if you're embedding data, then it should be in situations where reads massively outweigh writes. Uh, so because you're putting the... the uh, you're, you're optimizing for reads because you've got just that one get coming out. And if you're doing writes, multiple, lots of writes, then um, it's likely that some of the data that you're writing will appear in different contexts. So that might, so if we go back to, to this example here, if we were writing in updates to my address and we were writing it into multiple different documents that held that, then there's some chance that maybe the application layer is going to have a failure of some form which will happen halfway through that update happening and then you could end up with inconsistencies in, in the data of concerning my address across those multiple documents. Um, so yeah, so if you can be sure that you're going to be able to keep the data in sync across those different documents, or it doesn't matter, then maybe embedding's okay. And what do I mean by it doesn't matter? Well, in this example here, you might actually want to keep uh, a, a snapshot of what the address is at order time. So I could order this, um, it gets delivered to me, and then a few months later, I change my address. It's probably not appropriate to update it in a historical order document. So we want to keep a, a, a separate copy of that for each order. So when should you refer? Well, I'd say that with Couchbase, the, the, the default option should be to refer to data as much as possible. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that it's going to be a lot easier to manage canonical copies of the same information. In, so if you have one copy of it and you refer to it, then it's going to be a lot easier to keep it up to date. Um, and the other reason is that Couchbase is a database that you can use without worrying about it. So you know, one of the concerns that we have in, in I guess, using relational databases is, is based around how much time am I spending in the database layer waiting for something to come back. Whereas with Couchbase, because you're dealing with fairly simple gets, um, and you've got that in the caching, in the cache, generally speaking, if you've built your, 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 your if you've uh, sized your RAM accordingly, 
um, then you know, we could do those three or four gets, and it's going to still take us uh, milliseconds rather than thinking you know, in terms of, well, I've got to do a disk seek here, a disk seek there, and all of this, and pull it all back in together, as you would do with the relational data space. Um, and another time where you really want to make sure that you're referring to data is when the data has large growth potential. So for an example, you might, have, um, you might be storing instant messages in, um, in, in Couchbase. And if you imagine that uh, an instant messaging conversation between two people could go on for, for many years, obviously that has pretty much unbounded growth potential. So you wouldn't want to store that, the entire contents of that into one, one document. Uh, so instead, you'd have a master document that then referred out to some paginated form of the conversation. OK, coming on to key design. Um, so we used to you know, put in lots of thought into the design of our data. But actually, in, in the case of Couchbase, um, particularly if you're using it in the key value model, then key design is as important as document design. Because don't forget, if you're, if you're doing key value, like I said earlier, the key itself is your single route into the document. Now, obviously, if somehow you, you lose your key keys and you, you don't know what the keys are going to be, OK, you could create views. You could use nickel and so on. That's fine. But in general, speak, general terms, you, know, you want to be able to have predictable keys that you're always going to be able to go back to and, and compute what they are. So broadly speaking, we've come across three types of key, key design, I guess, in, um, in couch-based usage. One is just human readable, readable or deterministic uh, keys, like an email address of a user. They're going to log in, give you the email address as their username. You then have that route into their data. Another would be computer generated, so you know some random counter or, or UUIDs produced, and then compound keys, where you have um, a semantic element to to the key design. So you know, based on what the on the key name and how it's built, what sort of data you're going to get in that document. So let's have a look at human readable deterministic key. So uh, here we have a a fairly simple user class. Uh, we want to store that out as JSON, pop it in there, and we'll take the, like I say, whoops, we'll take the email address as the, um, as the, uh, as the key. So if, if we're keying that based on my email address, Matthew at couchbase.com, I go into system, I log in with that. We know that's what it is. We'll do a get, get my user profile, great. Now the problem comes if I later on change my email address, then I log in with my new email address. How do I get access to this? You know, how does the system get access to my user profile? Well, obviously, you know, we could just set up a redirect, or we could do something. Uh, we could maybe copy this over and just have a duplicate user profile. But that that seems a bit wasteful, perhaps, um, and not not necessarily terribly elegant. So another way we could do it is to have a just a random number, and now the key is entirely. Uh, removed from, from, from my email address. I can change my email address without having, without having to cause any headaches for the application developers. Um, but also, now, how do, we, how do we access this document? Well, one way would be perhaps slightly obnoxious. We could insist that everyone logs in with their randomly generated key, which seems to be what my bank insists on. Um, and so you have to go away and write it down. But I think that's kind of unfair. So what we could do instead is we could have a, a manual secondary index, a, a, a lookup document. So in this case, what we're doing is uh, when the user comes in and creates their account, um, we're going to use an atomic counter in Couchbase. So that lets you call it with an amount that you want to increment or decrement it by, and then it returns the number. Uh, so we'll, we'll have a, uh, a counter, we'll, and then we'll, we'll request that will increment it by one, we'll load it into user ID. And then we'll add our document under that user ID. So that'll be keyed, like, like I said, 1001 is the example here. And that's fine. So then we have another document, which is keyed by my email address, or some other distinguishing bit of information that I'm going to provide when I log in. And the contents of that email address keyed document is simply the key provided by the, the, by the counter. So if we do a get on Matthew at couchbase.com, it'll return 1001. Then we could do a get on 1001, and we got my user profile. So we've now uh, added a level of indirection. 
Um, you might be thinking, well, okay, you know, that's going to take more time. But like I, like I said, we're talking about sub-millisecond response times, so long as your, your data's in RAM. So it's not going to be that much of a hit. And actually, I, I, I have come across one person who was using Couchbase and in production, and for one of their queries, they had, I think, 200 lookups. Um, sounds crazy, but it's still within the realms of, of, of not particularly noticeable to a human when they're waiting for something to happen. And you know, you, you can extend this beyond, beyond just having uh, a single redirect from uh, you know, something like an identifying piece of information to a randomly generated key. Um, so you know, we can have multiple lookups um, based on email address, an alternative email address, a username, a Twitter ID, all that sort of stuff. And it will always just bring us back to this user profile. And that leads us on to compound keys. So you might notice here on the right that we've got, we've kind of shaped the, uh, the, 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 the keys based on what's in the contents of the document. Now, in, in some database systems, you might just use another bucket or, or some kind of namespacing um, that's provided by, by the database to do this. With Couchbase, a bucket is actually, it's not just a namespace, it's, it's an allocation of resources. So you want to, you know, you want to be careful about, you, 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 well, you want to be quite thoughtful about why you've created another bucket. You don't want to just do it to namespace. So here what we're doing is we're, we're prefixing our keys to tell us what's going to be in the, in the document to effectively namespace the keys. But there's more, more to it than that with, with compound keys. Um, we, can, um, we can effectively build up an entire picture of what we're going to get from the document based on what the key name is. Um, so here's our user profile, and it's an e-commerce site, so we want to see what, what that person's viewed. So we simply add on a product viewed to their user profile key name, and that gives us an array of what they've looked at. And you know, then product, product names, similarly. You know, we, we have an ID for the product of eight, and we know that whenever it's got a P, colon, colon in front, that's always going to be a product document. Um, and that gives us the, the basic product information. But say we want to have um, a, a, an image uh, that's stored separately, we could take it out of the main document and then just append IMG to the key name, and then that we will know that will always give us a string back that has uh, the URL for the image. So you can build up these, these key names um, to be relatively complex so that you always know what you're going to get back from that key. And again, it's, it's all about remembering that if you lose the key name or you, you, you don't have a predictable route into that key name, then getting the document back is going to be somewhat harder. OK, so we've looked at key value. Um, but nickel is, is a, well, it's, it's somewhat different. We're not in Kansas anymore with this. It's, uh, but there's no, need to, there's no need to worry. It's all good stuff. Uh, so nickel and views. Going back to the ad hoc and predictable queries, you know, when are you going to use these? So let's, let's just review that. Nickel is going to be something that you're going to use for ad hoc querying, so by and large, right? Whereas views are partly for predictable queries, but also where you're aggregating data and you, you know, you, you're perhaps starting to employ the, the full MapReduce side of, of Couchbase views rather than just using it as a secondary index mechanism. Uh, so in terms of data modeling, when you, what, what queries, sorry, what concerns are there? One is that with nickel, you're dealing entirely with, with JSON. So you can get, you can put in a, uh, you can have multiple nests of JSON documents, or JSON, sorry, levels, and query those in quite complex ways and come out with uh, an unnested JSON uh, result. So you get back the result just as, uh, we were listening to earlier, you get back the result that is what you want rather than having to process it on the application layer. Whereas views are, like I say, aggregate, aggregating data, finding uh, um, basically, you know, say for example, the number of people who have ever looked at a particular um, uh, product in an e-commerce system, you could do a view that goes across all of the uh, documents that store the the products that people looked at and then find the, that particular one that you're looking for and then aggregate it up. 
do a sum. Uh, the other thing is that nickel is, is really good, something you're going to want to use in large growth clusters because of the multi-dimensional scaling side of things, um, because it allows you to scale up the, the indexing and querying side of things uh, independently from the data storage. So why are we talking about this in a data modeling talk? Well, it's because you're going to have to think about how you model the data based on whether you're going to use the views, nickel, or key, key value. And you will choose nickel or views based on, on what sort of queries you're doing, but also how the shape of your cluster is going to go. OK, so let's look very quickly at nickel. The first thing to say about nickel is it's new. You know, we're still, we're still learning about how to model data for nickel and, and, and where that's going to, you know, what the best practices are. But if you look in your um, schedule, you'll see that there are a couple of talks about doing data modeling for Nickel and, and more broadly for Couchbase. So do, do have a look at those talks. So what are we talking about with Nickel? So the first thing to think about is the indexes you're going to use, um, your schemas is next, and also then key spaces, which I'll, I'll come on to in a moment. So indexes. The first thing to know about uh, data modeling for Nickel is that you always need an index. And you might say, well, the, the key names themselves are an index, but you need to specify to Couchbase um, that you want to use that as, as an index. So what, what do we mean? Well, the first, the first index you will ever have with Nickel is the primary. So you go along, you create a primary index, which will give, you a, um, which will give Nickel a route into those key names. And then you can start to create secondary indexes based on the data inside the documents that you can then query using Nickel. And if you choose not to create an index for a particular query, then you're going to have the, the effective equivalent of a table scan, which if you've got millions of documents is, is going to be something of a performance hit. So up front, you need to start thinking about what index you want to create based on what queries you're going to need to do. And then there's another question over what type of index is it going to be? GSI versus views. So views are, are what we're used to. You know, they're the, the, the kind of the standard way of, of creating uh, index secondary indexes in Couchbase. You you write a, your JavaScript function. You pull out uh, an index of documents based on a particular uh, key value pair that you found in those those JSON documents. Or there's our new global secondary indexes, which are created from the command line, or sorry, from the Nickel query line. So with CBQ or in the SCK. Uh, but generally speaking, you want to set them up beforehand because you don't want to go through the the load of of setting them up each time you do the query. Um, so let's have a look. How would you choose between the two of them? So global secondary indexes um, are probably going to be your, your go-to index for uh, Nickel. Um, they are, like I say, created with a Nickel query. You create index using GSI based on whatever the output is. Whereas views are created using JavaScript MapReduce queries. Uh, GSI, you're going to want to use, like I say, in, in larger scale situations where you have, um, multi you have dedicated query and indexing servers. So you're, you're going to scale things separately from the data layer. Um, and they're also Forest DB backed. So there's lots, well, there's, there's two or three talks this, in this conference about Forest DB. The, the, the main thing to say about this is it's, it's, it's going to be fast, faster, generally speaking, to query a, a, a GSI index than it will be to query a view. Uh, so why would you use views? Uh, primarily, I would say it's if you're going to want to do multidimensional geospatial uh, querying, because that is, that is the, the, the part that Nickel won't do. Um, and this is where I have to wrap up. So one, one more thing I would say is just joins are an important part of Nickel. And you'll come across this term key spaces right now. Um, key spaces means buckets in Couchbase, but it will mean more. And effectively, you're doing joins from primary key to primary key. So you will, in, your, in, in the one document, you will um, have a reference to the primary key of another document, and that is your join. Uh, it will work off secondary indexes soon, not right now. Um, that's a future feature. But just bear in mind that when you're, when you're managing your, uh, your schemas for your, your documents, you need to start thinking much more about how to keep consistency of, of basically key names across those. And also, you need to start thinking much more about putting a type into the documents, because that's a, an easy way to pull things out with, with Nickel, because you can then look for type of airline. Because remember, we're not, we're not namespacing based on buckets, but we're namespacing based on either key name or, in the Nickel case, based on generating indexes 
on the content itself. Um, so I think I have to end there. Let me just quickly say, if you want to qu ask me any questions, I'm around. Um, other sessions, 4.30 tomorrow, Steve Yen, co-founder of Couchbase, in this session, we'll be talking about a design pattern for basically creating um, applications, uh, and a large part of that is data modeling. There's also um, the nickel data modeling talk later today. So thank you very much. I have to get pulled off the stage. Cheers.